This video is brought to you by me. For $1 a month, you can support the channel directly and help me keep doing what I love. Thanks for watching and supporting. Saints Rows 1 and 2 felt cut from the same cloth. The stories were deeply connected and felt very tonally similar, balancing a really serious story with brutal rivalries and wacky off-the-walls gameplay and side activities. Saints Row the Third ushers in a new era for the Third Street Saints, taking them out of their element of Stillwater and putting them in a concrete jungle called Steelport. While the game as a whole takes a shift, the Saints are evolving too. When the third game begins, the Saints are household names, starring in commercials, launching clothing brands and energy drinks, and turning more corporate since acquiring the mega company Altor. They are no longer the underdogs. They've lost their edge. They aren't feared anymore. Quite the opposite. They are like rock stars. People stop them in the streets to take photos with them. So how does a street gang turned international icon get their groove back? They have to lose everything to remind them of who they are. The third Saints Row game is a lot like Mentos and Coca-Cola, explosive and quickly out of control. Pound for pound, this might be one of the most focused on fun games ever made. The pacing of the game is equivalent to being strapped to a rocket. The inclusion of the awesome button, a glorified sprint button, means you are ripping through the game and skipping past the boring parts. Want to steal a car? Jump through the window. Someone in your way? Hit them with a tornado DDT for no other reason than you can. In spite of how fun this game can be, it feels like an important part of the Saints Row identity is missing, the writing and the balance of highs and lows. There is very little substance to the story in Saints Row the Third, which is the most disappointing mark on an otherwise blast of a game. It opens on the Saints preparing to rob a bank in order for Method Actor and star of Vampire Show Nightblade Josh Burke to get first-hand experience of what it's like to be a Saint for an upcoming biopic about the gang. You're robbing a bank dressed like yourselves. Hell yeah. Who doesn't want to be Johnny Gett? Ultra postmodernism. I love it. During the robbery, the Saints are taking photos with fans when all the bank tellers draw their weapons and fire back. This is no ordinary bank, it turns out. The Saints are unknowingly trying to rob the Syndicate, an organization consisting of three gangs that runs the city of Steelport. The Saints are arrested and taken prisoner aboard an airplane. In exchange for their lives, Philippe Loren, the head of the Morningstar Gang, and the Syndicate in general, wants 66% of all the Saints' assets and holdings. Johnny Gatt, always the borrowing type, punches Loren in the face. The Saints, prisoners on Loren's plane, now need to fight their way off. Shondi and the boss split from Gat to escape, while Gat tries to fly the plane back to Stillwater. Before jumping out of the plane and talking on the intercom, Johnny is cut off. Gat is presumed dead, you never see him the rest of the game. But since you never see a body or any kind of funeral, you have to assume he's coming back, right? Nope, not in this game. Johnny's death is the inciting action that sets the story in motion. Get revenge for Gat by taking Steelport and obliterating the Syndicate. It's here that we get the most linear story in all of Saints Row thus far. SR3 really loses the freedom to approach the game in a way you want. Not only are the story missions always in the same order, but required activities, the diversions that were optional in previous games, are disguised as a way to progress the narrative. The respect system is drastically different here. You can earn respect by completing missions, and every level of respect you unlock earns you more abilities and buffs for your boss. You can increase your sprinting endurance, reduce how much damage you take from falls and bullets, and increase your ammo capacity. The story missions are no longer gated by how much respect you have. A lot of the series staple activities return in new capacities, joining the original versions. Mayhem gets an alternate mode called Tank Mayhem, which has you causing property damage in a tank as opposed to on foot. It's immensely satisfying to just demolish everything because it makes the numbers go <laughs> The most memorable and best new activity is Professor Genki's Super Ethical Reality Climax, a game show where you take weapons and progress through an obstacle course to kill mascots and rack up cash to appease the homicidal cat Professor Genki. The announcers are great, and Rob Van Dam brought a great performance, which cannot be said about Hulk Hogan's performance as the disgraced luchador Angel de la Muerte. So you hate discomfort. That's the sort of weakness that luchadors will capitalize on. Unless you harden up, Kilbane will crush you. But don't worry, 
I'll chisel you out of diamond. How? By making you experience the worst pain imaginable. Now come on. It's time for you to play in traffic. Right on, wait, what? Hollywood Hogan used his finishing move, the phone-in. It's not very effective. The activities in SR3 are as fun as ever for the most part, but they are really just the appetizer for the story missions. Let me set the scene for you. The Saints get word that Loren is throwing a penthouse party. You'll never make it in the front door. Instead, you take a helicopter above the building. You skydive into the party while Kanye West's power plays over the action. In this game, you free a giant from being used to clone brutes, get drugged and stripped naked before shooting your way out of a strip club, and euthanize an island of zombies because Burt Reynolds, who happens to be the mayor of Steelport, told you to. In that same vein, however, having zombies in a dedicated horde mode in the game does make Saints Row the Third feel a little bit dated as opposed to earlier entries. It's like the devs wanted to capitalize on the memes and trends of the time instead of making something that would stand alone a bit better. Besides the Morningstar, there is Matt Miller who runs a gang of techno punks and future bro crypto bros called the Deckers. Taking down Matt involves going into virtual reality and having a kaiju monster sword fight. Did anyone else just hear Mark Zuckerberg moan? The final gang you face in the game are the Luchadors, run by Eddie Kilbane Pryor, who becomes the main antagonist after stepping up to run the Syndicate after the Saints drop a metal boulder on Lorenz Dome. Having Kilbane take over as the main villain adds a lot of soapy wrestling drama to the game as the boss and him exchange long, passionate monologues about their hate for each other. <laughs> Are you for real? It's over, Eddie. In two weeks, no one's gonna remember your name. No one will remember me. You were a fucking clown, selling energy drinks and lunchboxes. You didn't care about the crowd, just a paycheck. And I changed that. Bullshit. Mark my words. When these hands are crushing your throat, your dying breath won't be an appeal to God or a message of love to your family. It'll be... Thank you, Kilbane. Man, I'm gonna enjoy shutting you up. This guy can cut a promo like nobody's business. As you play the game and earn money, you buy real estate and businesses. Buying real estate leads to recurring hourly revenue and discounts on goods in the stores you own, so it's worthwhile to invest early and often. The discounts come in handy for buying weapons because the game also introduces a weapon upgrade system which, after how punchy and powerful the guns were in the early games, it's a bit deflating having to get back to that point way later in the game. I missed my dual wielding cobras desperately until I got to the point where I was essentially dual wielding desert eagles with exploding rounds. Like the rest of the game, the upgrades allow you to get wackier and wackier. In addition to exploding bullets, you can also unlock electric rounds and armor piercing rounds and airstrikes. There is hardly a limit to how ridiculous the action gets considering every weapon has a nutshot mechanic meaning you can inflict groinal damage on anyone. One thing I rarely get around to talking about with games I cover is DLC because in some cases it's delisted and inaccessible. But with Saints Row the Third there are many ways to play with the DLC included on disc or cartridge and it's worth mentioning due to what it adds. There were three major DLC packs included in the season pass back in the day. Genki Bowl, Gangsters in Space, and The Trouble with Clones. Genki Bowl adds multiple new activities surrounding the Genkiverse, all under the umbrella of the sporting event Genki Bowl. New super ethical reality climax missions are added and take place in a reworked jungle themed arena with more verticality and places to explore. A new mayhem mode is added where you roll over property and cars in a large yarn ball that can shoot shockwaves out. Lastly, there is a new kind of escort mission where you drive Genki around and perform murderous tasks he calls out in a car that shoots flames. This was a simple and effective kind of DLC because I can never get enough Genki content. Probably the best of the three offerings. Gangsters in Space puts you in a starring role in a movie of the same name, where the saints have to save the earth from aliens. I wonder where we'll see that concept again. This was the worst DLC in my opinion because it was some of the most frustrating missions in the game. There are on-rail shooting segments that go on way too long, and even with two people it involved more restarts than we took during our entire main game combined. It's a cool concept, but it's ridiculously annoying to play. Lastly is the trouble with clones, the DLC that teased the return of Johnny Gat. Well, not quite. 
After Johnny's death, a super fan named Jimmy collects any Gat belongings that could feasibly have his DNA on it. Gum, sunglasses, etc. Using these items, he tries to clone Johnny, except instead, he creates a brute version of the fallen saint that ransacks Steelport. The three missions take you around the city trying to find Gat before the military takes him out. The best parts of this involve Pierce dressing up as Gat's fallen lover Aisha and singing songs to attract the brute. Baby, on the way you move, and it on the floor, and what you're doing, and might get some more. Wrong with having a little fun, and you're bumping, bumping. It's like my checks did back in the day, before I got this paper, before I got paid. By the end of it, you calm Tag down and recruit him to the Saints. Saints Row the Third scrapped the way the first two games were structured. It left a lot to be desired in the story department. The third game pushed the emotional side of Saints Row to the back burner and took away the balance of wackiness and seriousness. However, the raw gameplay itself is so good that it makes up for it in spades, providing one of the most fun open world games ever made. It does kind of trick the player into playing activity missions disguised as story missions, but once you get to the meat of the game, it really picks up. It's a polarizing game to say the least, but as for if 2 or 3 is better, I'd rather hear from you in the comments. All told, I still prefer 2 as a more complete game. Shortcomings and controversial direction aside, Saints Row the Third still offers an incredible amount of fun and exciting gameplay to keep you entertained, especially if you replay the game with a friend like I did. But if you come into this game expecting the story to pick up where Saints Row 2 left off, you're going to be sorely disappointed in the story that's left, leaving little control over how to approach it. Thanks for making it this far in the video. If you liked it, hit the like button because it helps me out a ton. If you want to watch more videos like this, hit subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, send this video to someone you'd like to play Saints Row with, or head to the Patreon link in the description. For $1 a month, you get early access to all my videos. I'd like to thank my higher tier patrons, Okayla, Just Jessica, 8-Bit Jesus, Andrew Elmore, Andrew Lang, Andrew Donahoe, and Kudahori. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.